for coming to our next rendition of our webinar ser series, Let's Grow Virtually. Uh, we'd like to first thank all our wonderful sponsors who have put this series on without their help. Uh, certainly makes things a little bit more challenging, but uh, we appreciate all their all their help and everything they do in supporting us and Rutgers University. We've got some, uh, so we've got some uh, working, got some uh, housekeeping to take care of right now. Uh, so we're going to mute all your all your microphones, so you won't we won't be able to hear your chatter. And uh, it's going to help Matt, Dr. Elmore, present his his. Uh, Show and his, uh, and also. So even though we can't hear you, but you can, you can still uh, give us a question through our chat box. We're going to be monitoring that throughout the whole session. So if you have a question, uh, we'll we'll get it get it to Matt, and we can he can answer it. Um, it may either come during that section that. That section that he's talking about, or we'll hold it to the end, depending on uh, on where he where he is in his presentation. Okay, so another thing is we're going to have some quizzes here to make sure that you're actually here and online and present. Uh, this is for the uh, DEP to make sure you you qualify for your CEUs. So uh, it's not a pass fail question, but uh, it's just to show that you're there and you're actively viewing, viewing the screen. Um, also, another thing is you need to take a picture of your driver's license and send it over to uh, the executive director at tur njturfgrass.org. Uh, this also is a way that to show that you are who you are on the computer screen and that you're not someone else isn't uh, taking your spot. So this has got to get done as well to receive credits. So, so first off, we got a first poll just to make sure you're here. A little practice. So we're going to launch a poll question for you, and uh, you have a few minute, a minute or so to answer. So you, everybody, must uh, answer the poll question. Okay. So the first question is: Are you an NJTA member? I'll give you a little bit of time to, to answer. Looks like about 60% of you have been answered. Sixty-six or correct. Get another minute for everybody to submit their answers, please. Oh, I'm 70. Mm -hmm. 
All right, another 10 seconds and we'll close it, close it down and get rolling with the show. <clears throat> so if uh, you got to answer the poll, I guess, to get pesticide credits, is that how this works? Yeah, we're going to be doing that throughout this, throughout the show, throughout the uh, presentation. There's going right. to be three other, three other questions to, uh, to answer. So. Right, we're going to close it out. All right, 84% of you submitted. All right, and with that said, we're going to have Josh take over right now. Please like meet Josh Papera. He's with us here at the NJTA and also sales rep for Harold's. Uh, here you go, Josh. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. I want to just say I've been on the board now for a year, and it's actually an amazing experience where we sat down about six months ago and decided to put these webinar series together, and we couldn't be more happier with the outcome and support from everybody in the field. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Matt Elmore, who joined Rutgers in November 2016 as the new weed science specialist in turf grass, landscape, and pasture and forages. He earned his bachelor in turf science from Penn State University before moving south and earning his master's and PhD. Oh, I lost the uh, screen, Jay. I just gave it to. Sorry, I switched over to Matt. All right. So there you go, Matt, Doc, yeah. take it All away. Right. <laughs> okay, what am I, uh, let's see. I think, um... Should I, am I sharing just the PowerPoint right now? Yep, you're good. Uh, yeah, thanks for the intro, Josh, and uh, good to be with everybody this afternoon. So I'm gonna put this slideshow up and then I'll start talking because I can't do two things at once. All right, so we see just the, sl the slide and not the presenter view? Right. Okay, cool. No, we see this, we don't see the slideshow, we see everything. Yes, yeah, yeah, start, your, start your slideshow. Uh, okay, what about, what do you see? I, I shared my um, PowerPoint, supposedly, or do you see my desktop? I see your desktop. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll have to put the PowerPoint over on my desktop. Is that better? What do you see now? Nothing. Still nothing? So you don't even see my desktop anymore? See a white screen. Uh, went blank. Boy, all right, that's not good. This worked when we did it the other day. All right. Um, maybe I'll try this. How about this? See your desktop. Now do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, yeah. You see your program, but not the actual presentation. What about now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, um, and let me get this off of here. So you see just the slides, right? Yep, we're good. All right, cool. So yeah, so I think, and I've got the, the chat up here, and then Jason and Josh um, are going to interrupt me as we go, just to kind of provide a little bit of a back and forth, I think, because I've got probably you know fewer slides than we need. For a typical kind of lecture. So I think the idea is to have a little bit of a conversation so we can discuss some of the challenges that everyone's been having with goosegrass in New Jersey. Because it is, I think, you know, I, I'm relatively new to New Jersey. I've been here about four years, I guess, a little over four years, um, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, Josh. And so um, this is a new weed problem for me in Cool Season Turf. You know, whenever I moved here, I thought, well, you know, it'll be interesting to see what everybody wants to, to talk about and, um, or, you know, problematic weeds. And, and then when I came, I think, for the interview, it was obvious that goosegrass was kind of a pretty major, you know, newly problematic weed. So um, we've been spending some time researching it. And uh, I think the cool thing about today is that, you know, I'll get to share a little bit of what we learned and also get some feedback from you on maybe what's been working or what uh, you know, questions about what might work or, or whatever as we go. So I'm going to kind of go through and share my, I guess, theories. And some of them have been 
you know, backed up with, with science uh, on why goosegrass is a problem and how do we, you know, fix that problem. So we'll go through, you know, different strategies for goosegrass control. All right. So I see we now should see a different slide. Is that correct? All right. So um, here's a picture of goosegrass in a golf course fairway in the middle of the summertime in New Jersey. And the reason the goosegrass is white is because it was uh, treated with Pilex herbicide, which uh, I guess, unfortunately, a lot of us have gotten really familiar with because this weed has become such a problem. And Pilex is one of the tools that we have to control it. Um, and so the reason I put this picture up is just to highlight, I think, the level of infestation that uh, I've seen. And this is not uncommon. Uh, in the state in the last few years. So um, it is a major problem. And I think it, you know, in terms of how severe it gets, it, it may be even more problematic in the northern United States right now in, in cool season turf than it is in the southern United States, even though goosegrass is probably more prevalent in the southern United States. So it's interesting. And I think one of the reasons that it's problematic is because it's a new weed, um, but there are, are, are other reasons as well, because for a lot of us in the room, it's actually probably not that new anymore. We're just tired of dealing with it. So I'll share some theories on, on why it's a problem. Um, here are kind of some of the reasons I, I think it's a problem that we'll talk about today. We'll talk about uh, weather and how that may be influencing things. We'll talk about pre-emergence herbicide selection and timing. We'll talk about post-emergence herbicide options, um, and then we'll also just talk about, you know, general turf cover, um, being that this is an annual weed. It is going to be really competitive if there's turf under stress, thin turf, uh, late in the summer. So, um, again, as we go, Jason and Josh, just feel free to to, to uh, interrupt, and then I'll also Jason, Jason the will be monitoring the uh, chat for us. Yeah. All right. Deal. Okay, so one of the, you know, juice grasses, it seems like every year, you know, I, I talk to people on the phone in the summertime and it seems like every year is the worst year for goose grass uh, in New Jersey. And it also seems like it's moving farther north. You know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, it sounds like it was more of a problem in, in the mid-Atlantic United States. And if you look back through a lot of the research that's been done. Um, it, a lot of it was coming out of the University of Maryland when Pedro Noden was still there in the 80s, and, and there wasn't really a lot from farther north, which it suggests that maybe it wasn't a huge problem in the, in, you know, as you get north of that mid-Atlantic. Um, but you know, I, I'm getting questions about it from, again, increasingly northern areas, and it seems like it is moving. So. One of the reasons could be weather. You know, I think I look back, I know this is old now, but I look back to 2018 and that horrible uh, end of the summer that we had. And, and these are the types of situations where goose grass, a weed like goose grass can get a foothold. You know, we've got way above average rainfall from the end of July to the end of August. Uh, combine that with above average temperatures and you get a situation where a summer annual weed that really loves these conditions, these hot, wet conditions, coupled with, you know, cool season turf grasses like bed grass that really don't, they suffer from disease at this time. And that's kind of a recipe for uh, a weed getting a foothold again, because this goose grass will really start to grow rapidly. It'll set seed and obviously being in an annual weed, uh, that seed is really what we're battling every spring. So. Uh, you get, again, hot, wet conditions late in the summer where turf grass thins out. That goose grass gets more prolific, produces more seed, and then you're kind of stuck with a problem that, you know, may have set seed several years ago that you're still still dealing with today. So, um, you know, and even in a year unlike 2018, it seems like, you know, the summer is going to be last a little bit longer. Um, and so we're asking more of the same program, I guess you could say, you know, we're asking more of it uh, than we ever have every year. So you know, those warmer, longer summers, wetter summers especially, are going to uh, break down those pre-emergence herbicides more rapidly and basically challenge them to last longer. So if we're not adjusting to that, and that doesn't necessarily just mean increasing your rate of pre-emergence herbicide, but if you're not 
you know, doing other things to adjust and you're kind of you know basing a lot of your your program on the pre-emergence then uh, things can start to go wrong and goosegrass pressure increases and so we might need to start thinking a little bit differently as we have new weed problems um, so you know if you get a situation like this at the end of the season the real problem is not really for that season although it may seem like that in the short term but the real problem here is that we've got these goosegrass plants producing a whole bunch of seed that seed is obviously going to be the crop for next year and also uh, future crops because you know those seed that are set a lot of them remain dormant and can remain dormant in the soil for many years waiting for the right opportunity to, to germinate in the subsequent year to keep that you know keep that population going so that's sort of an intro and i think we have another poll here hopefully this one goes a little quicker yep. i guess the key thing is if you're an attendee you need to uh you need to answer these polls so that you the state knows that you're still there and so i guess we, we, we have the, another, me, sorry I'm go ahead an, i'm gonna launch another poll right now and there you go. What were you going to say, Matt? I was going to ask, you know, Josh and Jason, so you guys have been here longer than I have. I mean, where do you see goosegrass, you know, that's been a problem? Is it becoming a problem in farther, you know, farther northern areas? Or what do you see in terms of what's been changing in the last, you know, 10, 10 years or so with this weed? Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Jake. Well, for me on the golf course, I don't see much of it. Uh, just in some areas, smaller areas. I mean, I don't treat where it's not that pronounced on my golf course. I mean, mm -hmm. I get a little bit in greens, but it's just a matter of walking a green one day and kind of fucking out 10 or 15 plants, and uh, I'm pretty good. Uh, I get a lot in the collars. That's probably about it. Okay. Yeah, so going into that collar, Matt, like sprays versus granulars, if you're spraying backpacks or booms, or what? what do you feel? Is the best way to attack that yeah we can uh we can talk about that and when we talk about pre-emergence i think it, it depends on the product i mean the biggest risk in the collars is that you potentially overlap that pre-emergent especially if you're using a, a drop spreader you know i think i've seen you know drop spreader we're, we're going to use it for a drop spreader to ring the collar uh, which makes sense but the thing you have to be careful of is when you get you know around the green that you don't go over the same you know, a little bit into the area you just treated and potentially and you're 2Xing that pre-emerge. Um, and then also if you're going to make multiple rings around that collar, it's really tricky not to, you know, overlap with the drop spreader. Um, and if you overlap with the drop spreader, basically, you know, you're 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 doubling it. With, whereas with a broadcast spreader, you know, that overlap is it's going to be more like a boom nozzle where it's not 100 percent. You know what I mean? So. Um, it's, right, so we're gonna... it depends on the product. I mean, um, but I think that's one of the things I guess I would be careful of if I'm using a drop spreader in a collar area, if that yeah. is the main place that this is problematic for you. All right. Not to cut you off, Matt, we're going to close the, close this down so we can get going. Okay, great. I can't see the poll anyway, so all yeah. right. All right. You're all set there, Matt. So does that help answer your question about callers, or do we need to? Yep. Okay. Good deal. And if there's questions from attendees, I'll I'll try to uh, get those as we as we come as well. All right, you're all set. Alrighty. So pre-emergence herbicide selection, and this is one of the things that has. Um, surprised me a little bit in terms of how important it is. Um, whenever I first, you know, we first started doing work, my first year was 2017. So we first started doing some work that summer on, okay, let's go to a golf course, put out some trials, looking at pre-emergence um, and see what we get. And my theory was that, well, since goosegrass germinates later, and we'll talk about that, and germinates farther into the summer, you know, we can see it germinate even into late August, um, that we just need pre-emergence herbicide programs where we make multiple applications, you know, where you make one application at your typical crabgrass timing, and then because this weed germinates over a longer period of time, to keep that residual in the soil, you just need to make another application six to eight weeks later. Um, and that will, will really help. 
so that was my theory and then in 2017 we did some work and it was apparent that uh, that wasn't all that was going on um, so we followed up with some work in 2018 and started to notice uh, this kind of this trend where um, we started to detect what we thought was resistant populations um, so we've now done this work at multiple golf courses in the state over multiple years and I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. Um, so one of the things that we found again at this first site and second site that we did work in 2017 and 2018 where again we, we were really we just wanted to look at different different products. So we looked at protiamine, pendimethalin, thiopyr, oxidizon and um, what we found is that the mitotic inhibiting herbicides, or sometimes we call them root pruning herbicides, those would be uh, especially we've noticed thiopyr, but also prodiamine um, and pendimethalin were completely ineffective. Um, and so we took uh, seed from these golf courses and we brought them into the lab and we put the, planted the seeds into petri dishes filled with agarose that you see here, that agarose in this picture was spiked with dimension herbicide. And so what you want to see if you're a golf course superintendent is what you see on the left hand side of the screen. So we put those goosegrass seeds, uh, hopefully you can see them there on that agarose. Oops. And pull up a laser pointer here, hopefully. Um, so what you can see hopefully is these seeds that are placed on the agarose and then the roots want to grow down this way, the shoots want to grow up this way. And again, what you want to see is if you're a superintendent is that your goosegrass is completely, the root growth is completely inhibited by that herbicide. You can see those seeds actually did germinate, but there's just this kind of ball of, of root tissue there because these herbicides prevent those cells from dividing and the roots can't elongate. Um, and that's how they, they work in the, in the soil uh, outside. And what we found is with these populations is um, that with certain amounts of dimension in there, the root growth proceeded normally. And it was almost as if the herbicide wasn't there. Um, whereas again, with this susceptible population, we get good control. So, so that was sort of the first indication that, okay, um, maybe something is wrong because you know, my understanding, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but that a lot of the pre-emergence herbicide programs that we used on fairways and roughs, on not necessarily uh, collars and approaches and putting greens, but a lot of them are, are based around the thiopyr. It provides excellent crabgrass control and normally you would expect good goosegrass control um, but again what we found is you know the, these the, the thiopyr it seemed like in the field was completely failing and again we see it in the lab here um, we look at that a different way you can kind of see here different rates of the thiopyr um, in terms of pounds of active ingredient per acre with the susceptible population in the greenhouse where we seed into these pots you can see at extremely low rates in the susceptible population on the bottom of the screen um, at extremely low rates as low as 0 0.1 pounds per acre which is much lower than you would typically apply this in the field uh, we're getting complete goosegrass control whereas with the resistant population we're not getting control uh, you know at the at or above rates that we typically use in the field and so um, this is sort of just confirming what we just saw in, the, in those Petri plates. Um, but the other thing I wanna, I guess, put in everyone to consider here, put in your mind to consider is that, remember when you apply that pre-emergence herbicide in April or May, probably, you know, say you apply uh, 0.38 pounds of dithiopyr or three quarters of a pound of prodiamine. Um, that's in the soil on day one. And then immediately after that, the microbes get to work and start to break that down. So by the middle of the summer, uh, you have half or even less than you originally applied in the soil. And that's all dependent on soil type and rainfall and microbial activity. And so um, again, most of the breakdown with the, the, the dissipation of that herbicide in the soil is, is driven by microbes. So, um, you know, what you, you really want to see good control at rates considerably lower, you know, than you apply on day one. So that, again, this sort of confirms that uh, what, what we're seeing here. And question, this, Matt. Yeah. So Matt, I, we got a question for Would you. The, uh, the split applications be the target for this? 
Yeah, with with dimension. Yeah. Or prodiamine or something like that. Going with like a booster, maybe at the end of June. Yeah. So that's a good question. So you get a, a response like this, and you say, well, hey, that that uh, yeah, that goose grass is still controlling, or sorry, that dimension is still controlling that resistant population at that really high rate there. Uh, why not? Why don't we just apply it again? Um, and you, if you did apply it again, that would be a good option if you had an herbicide that that, that goosegrass was susceptible to. Um, but if you have a resistant population, it's not a good use of herbicide to be uh, to be making that application again. So that's a good question. Um, and there's a question: Have you tested barricade against this? What what are the results? Yes, uh, we have, and it, what's it's really interesting that a lot of these populations also seem to have resistance to prodiamine as well. Um, we have we don't completely understand it yet because what we've been doing is basing this the, the way we test these responses. We've been basing it off of what uh, has been found in the, in the southeastern United States. So just for some background. You know, goosegrass, I mentioned in the beginning, has been much more problematic in Bermuda grass in the southeastern United States and, you know, around the world for a longer period of time. And so, you know, back in the 80s when these dinitrovanilin herbicides came out, you know, things like orizolin was used back then, a little bit, pendimethalin, and then later came prodiamine. They're all in the same class of herbicides. So if you get resistance to one, you typically get resistance to all of them. Um, so what happened with those is by the mid 80s, to especially mid 90s, you know, superintendents were using them repeatedly year after year for goosegrass control and resistance started to be a problem. It was first reported in the 1980s and then, you know, became more widespread. Um, and in that case, um, there was, you know, they got really high levels of resistance, higher than we're seeing here. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing here is sort of lower levels of resistance that are, but that are still really significant in terms of, of your management of this, of this weed. And, and they basically render this herbicide you know, not a tool you want to use for goosegrass control uh, if you've got resistance. Um, and so they would often see resistance to prodiamine, but, but they wouldn't necessarily look at, at the thiop here. Um, and so those populations were selected or basically came to be after many years of prodiamine applications. In this case, I think what's different in the northeastern United States is that we relied more on dithiopyr uh, than, it, than it has been relied on in the southeastern United States. So dithiopyr is a mitotic inhibiting herbicide, but a, thought to be a slightly different mode of action than prodiamine um, and pendimethalin. So I think the way that this resistance has developed is different because we've been looking on a molecular level in these plants for the types of resistance that they see in the southeastern United States and we're not seeing it. So there's something different going on and we're not really sure what it is yet. So long story short, some of the populations we've looked at have low levels of resistance to prodiamine and some don't and we're not really sure why they do or don't. Um, I, my uh, advice for you as a manager at this point is if you suspect this to be a problem that it would probably be a good idea not to use not to rely exclusively on the thiopyr prodiamine or pendimethalin if you get a mode of action like a, another product like tower that's a different mode of action it, it might work better we don't really know um, what we have found is that uh, oxidizon, which is a different mode of action and known to be an effective goosegrass product, is extremely effective in these resistant situations. So the graph I'm showing here is goosegrass control on a golf course um, with a resistant population. It was actually the one that I showed you uh, in the last two slides. Here's goosegrass control on that golf course you know, with that resistant population. Um, so a, a bigger bar is better. So with the thiopyr and prodiamine, we essentially got no control. Um, when we looked at single applications of oxidizon, which is Ronstar, again, different mode of action, completely different mode of action than the mitotic inhibitors, we got excellent control, what you would typically expect from a susceptible population. These were single applications at three, two and a half, or two pounds. 
um, in the yellow bar there, and then the split applications for three pounds, two and a half pounds, or two pounds, followed by another two pound application six to eight weeks later. And so here's what kind of control we got. You can see control is a little bit better when we applied two applications, but this is a really high pressure scenario, as you can see from this picture. So um, essentially what we had in, in August here was a fair way of goosegrass. And it happened to be that this was a great summer for this weed to grow. So, um, it, you know, a good thing if you're looking to test these kind of things. But, um, you know, here's what we had with the thiopure applied at half a pound. We also looked at split applications with the thiopure. The results were the same. Um, and actually, I have that here. So here's the thiopure at really high rates. Uh, 0.75 pounds for the year is probably double what, what most of us are applying. Um, didn't get good control from that either. But that oxidizon, again, we've got a different mode of action, much better control. And you see there's a few goosegrass plants in this image. Uh, this, that's to be expected in an area where, oh, this is a wet area on the fairway. This was 2018, we had severe flooding in some cases, severe pressure, not a lot of great turf competition. So this, this serves a couple points. One, that the oxidizon is, is excellent uh, in these resistant situations. And two, that even you know, with a good pre-emergence program in a really high pressure scenario, you wanna have multiple tools at your disposal to try to get through that season. So, um, that I hope that kind of sets the, the stage a little bit. In terms of how prevalent this is, you know, I mentioned we did the work on two golf courses. So in 2019, we went a little bit further um, and collected 23 populations from mostly from New Jersey, but we got a couple from Pennsylvania as well. And um, 17 of those 23 were, uh, were have some level of resistance, and we're still trying to understand that, that right now. And we detected protiamine resistance in a few populations. I should actually update that to several at this point. Um, so these were uh, athletic fields and primarily golf courses, fairways, we collected from uh, golf courses that were having problems with goosegrass. So, you know, Jason, you mentioned in your situation, uh, you know, I don't have much goosegrass. So, you know, you, if we had gone to courses like yours, I don't know if we would have found the same thing. But we went to courses where it's like, yeah, you know, I've been putting out the thigh up here for several years and this goosegrass is just out of control. It seems like this pre-emergent, I might as well be putting out water. Um, so those are the courses we went to. It wasn't a truly random sample, but we did want to see, okay, is this, you know, is this just two random courses we went to in 2017 and 2018, or is this a, a widespread problem throughout the state? So I don't know if that kind of summarizes the resistance, or Jason and Josh, if you have any questions about that. But uh, I, no, I think it's... I've had more people have issues on, like, uh, tees or shaded areas under trees that are wet and... Mm -hmm. areas like that the tees have been a major issue in some golf courses but yeah with going with the uh the wrong star granular we're going to try to uh, combat that with a couple courses yeah and tees are 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 a difficult kind of situation because um and really a good environment for goosegrass it likes areas that are highly trafficked presumably because of the thin turf grass maybe more so than the compaction and then you've also got a situation where uh, a lot of that pre-immersion is being removed by, by golfers because, it, you know, it's going to reside in the soil and those divots are going to be removed. So um, it, it could be resistance in those situations um, or it might not be. I think one of the things that even if you don't have resistance, it's important to consider the fact that uh, there are lots of lots of properties dealing with it. And so, you know, if you wanted to prevent it from happening at your property, you know, using a product like Oxidizon with a different mode of action, post-emergence products uh, with different modes of action is gonna be important because for whatever reason, different than crabgrass, goosegrass seems to have this ability to, you know, uh, to adapt and get, and, you know, obtain resistance to these uh, to these herbicides. This is not just a northeast cool season turf problem. This is goosegrass does this in every every setting where it's a weed problem. 
So we yeah. have that ability. We just had a question pop up, Matt. Yep. Uh, person's had 0% control on fairways the last year with Ronstar. Uh -huh. is Ronstar, is, it a, is that a product that you need to apply on for several years before you see control? Good question. Um, no, you should be, you should get control the, the first year you apply it. The tricky thing about Ronstar, especially compared to Dimension, a lot of times we, when, when Dimension's applied, you know, we're applying it after crabgrass emerges. And we actually, you know, it's a good product because you can apply it in the middle of May and, and usually crabgrass is germinated by then, but it controls those little crabgrass seedlings. Oxidizon really needs to be applied as a true pre, um, and it has a different mode of action. So it's actually you know, burning that seed leaf as it emerges through the soil. So that seed germinates and that seed leaf comes out of the seed. And as it tries to grow up through the soil treated with Ronstar, um, it, that Ronstar in the soil actually burns off that, that leaf tissue. And that's how it works. So even if you've got you know, tiny little goosegrass seedlings and you apply that Ronstar, uh, it's not going to work at all. Whereas Dimension, you know, if the population were susceptible, might might have some efficacy. Hey, Matt, would also the uh, active ingredient on the ground being above that 2.5 pounds? Yeah, we can talk, it's a good, maybe a good time to talk about rates. Um, we can go back to this slide here. Um, if you go to the southeastern United States in Bermuda grass, you know, you've got a long summer. They're typically applying oxidizon three, probably more like four pounds to the acre. If you look, um, I was looking back a couple of weeks ago at some of the work that was done in the 80s and 90s with the, uh, Ronstar and cool season turf, and then some of the work that we've been doing. And it suggests to me that I think, I think two pounds per acre, two and a half pounds per acre per year is a good starting point. And you want to um, you want to get at least from the work we've done, and is get at least a two pounds with that first application, to uh, two to two and a half pounds. You could even go up to three, and and you know you're going to be able to work. Uh, you're going to get to develop, I guess you could say, a feel with this after using it with your property, using it on your property over multiple seasons. You know, talk to your industry representatives about what they think based on the severity of your problem. But uh, two pounds typically works pretty well in our trials. In some trials where we've got a high pressure or maybe we've got a severe summer where that pre is gonna break down a little bit more, that three pound rate is probably gonna be where you need you wanna be. It just really depends on lots of different factors. Um, the main ones being you know, how, much, how many seeds are in the soil. Uh, because you, know, you look at a plot like this, you know, there might be a couple hundred goose grass plants in there. Um, but you know, one of the one of the things we found in in our work looking at when do these seedlings emerge is that you can get uh, several thousand or maybe even ten thousand plants uh, that emerge, you know, in a square yard or, or or thousands of plants in a square foot. So um, you know, you're looking, you're kind of asking this herbicide, you know, if you've got if you've got one plant per square foot, that's uh, that you're looking at that as a failure of that herbicide. But in reality, you know, that herbicide controlled. 9,999 of the plants that were in there. Um, if you've got a situation where your seed bank isn't quite as severe and you've got maybe only a couple, you know, 50, 50 seeds per, per square foot, well, you're asking a lot less of that herbicide. So again, it kind of depends on that. And I think, you know, um, you could start, you know, at, at two to three pounds. And if you don't have success with that, then maybe the following year you want to make a split application or, or a booster, a, a second application of that herbicide six to eight weeks later, or increase your rate a little bit. Um, you know, I, I advocate for starting, you know, at at least two pounds, maybe three, but not higher than that, um, because you don't want to be spending money on product that you, you may not need. So um, does that answer your question, Josh, about rate? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, one of the things we have seen pretty consistently is that, and this isn't a knock on the Anderson's Crab and Goose product because this has a, a great fit in a lot of situations like around putting greens, but this product applies one and a half pounds per acre at that max rate. That max rate is 2.6 pounds 
per thousand of product, that applies one and a half pounds per acre of oxidizon. That is probably adequate where you've got really good turf competition, you know, and approaches and collars, you know, you've got that dense turf. But in those areas like tee boxes and, you know, shaded areas or, or areas that are prone to flooding and turf loss in the summer, um, in our trial work, that one and a half pound rate does not perform as well as a two pound rate of oxidizon or a, a three pound rate. So um, we can talk a little bit about other products. I mean, the key with the, the oxidizon is it needs to be applied as a granular. The Ronstar 2G is no longer being manufactured. So probably the, you know, the Anderson's product is a good option around greens and it's even labeled for use on greens. And then for the other areas, working with your fertilizer manufacturers, distributors, because many of them formulate products that contain oxidizon. Um, and the key is this has to be applied granularly. So um, it, uh, it cannot be sprayed. If you spray, you're gonna cause severe injury to the turf. It should be applied to, to dry turf and watered in. My advice is to try to water it in the same day you apply it. Um, it would it, it will work if you wait until the next day, but one of the concerns is that you apply this product to dry turf, maybe it doesn't quite get worked into the turf that afternoon, then the next morning you've got mowers on it and you're potentially dragging you know, granular, you're, you're dragging prills around well, on the wet turf canopy. And that is a situation where you can get some, some transient injury. Again, it typically grows out of it. But the best practice is to um, to get the product out, and especially on greens, you know, as soon as you can, as soon as you get off that green, get some, get, you know, a quarter inch of water on it, try to get that product worked into the soil where it's not going to cause any injury. So um, I, I think it's always nerve, it would make me nervous, I guess, if I was a superintendent to try to use a new product, especially an herbicide with a different mode of action. So, you know, I list these keys here, but I think if you talk to your peers, to your sales representatives, you know, to your industry industry folks, they'll, they'll be able to help you utilize this product um, if you have not done so in the past. It, it's, uh, I think the use is increasing. You know, it's known to be an excellent goosegrass product. Um, obviously, um, if we continue to use exclusively Ronstar, then we're probably going to be in the same situation here in 10 years because oxidizon resistance has been uh, detected in the southeastern United States and is becoming a little bit more of a problem there. So, um, so the take-home uh, message is switch to switch chemistry, switch mode of actions. Mm -hmm. Don't just increase because I feel 25 yeah. years ago when I got to New Jersey and started. You know, I feel like we were at the quarter pound rate and now guys are using all the way up to 0.38 to 0.4 to get control of goose and crab. And it's just a trend we've seen. With, with dithiopyr? Yes. Dimension? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you've got a situation where you feel like that dimension or proteamine isn't, isn't working at all, and these are great products, it's just, um, you know, when we've got weeds that have this propensity for resistance, they, uh, if they're the main tool relied upon, then, then they're not as effective. The other thing to remember too, if, if you're looking to incorporate oxidizon into a program is that oxidizon is not as effective on crabgrass. Um, so uh, keep that in mind that if you have a lot of crabgrass in the seed bank, you, you probably want to have some dithiopyr in that program still in your, in your, in this, so um, greens is a, is a really is tough uh, in terms of control. There's really not, there are not post-emergence options. There are pre-emergence options. Those are listed here. The Anderson's crabgrass and goosegrass is one that uh, contains oxidizon. Benzamec is effective on crabgrass, but the research data suggests it's not effective for pre-emergence goosegrass control. Two percent has some efficacy for pre-emergence goosegrass control, which is somewhat effective, but that's actually, my understanding is very difficult to find and not being manufactured anymore, or it's not exactly sure what's going on, but I have not heard that one's easy to find. 
Um, Anderson's dimension is labeled for you on putting greens and might be effective, but um, you know, you want to be careful about injury to the putting green uh, with, with that one. Use it carefully. And also we, we've just talked about some of the issues maybe with uh, resistance to Thiopure. But again, the Thiopure is still a good product for your other weeds. And it was, you know, it's always been good on goosegrass and excellent on crabgrass. So in a resistance situation, it just is um, essentially less effective, considerably less effective. All right. So any questions hey, on follow-ups? Because we're yeah. going to kind of move away from yeah, that. We've got a question from our audience. Uh, regards to oxidize on rate question for split applications you see that is a yeah. three pound rate split over two one and a half pound apps or two three pound app rates yeah it's tricky and we haven't done a lot of work with the uh, actual total or you're just doubling up okay good question so the three pound i would not split that into two apps um the three pound would be the the initial application uh yes um so what we have done is we've applied two or three pounds initially and followed up with another two to three pounds six to eight weeks later so that would be a split application or a i should call it a multiple application program or josh i like your use of booster application program um that's probably that that would that's something that we have research data to support i guess you could say um but it, again it really depends on you know your property what what you could do is, is start at two pounds apply it once for, for the year see how that does and have a have a post emergence product on at the ready in case you get breakthrough and if it does not work well then you might want to increase the rate for your next season any other questions on uh products especially pre-products we'll talk a little bit about post products later but uh, real quick matt yeah. Just uh, so the optimum timing is prior to goosegrass germination. That's really the take home when you're using some of these products because, yeah. especially really on really with the oxidize on. Yeah. Okay. And that's a good segue into the next part of our presentation. So, the other question that it seemed to me, or that I wanted to answer, I guess, when I got here, is when does goosegrass actually germinate? Um, because you know, if you read some of the extension materials, it says, well, four to six weeks after crabgrass, um, but you actually start digging and no one's actually done any research to prove that. I think it's just sort of anecdotal observations. You know, like you got someone like me who sees crabgrass germinate in their plots, um, you know, in mid-April, and then they go out there, you know, every week, and okay, in mid-May, we saw some, some goosegrass seedlings. And those sort of things kind of work their way into extension fact sheets and um, and then work their way into kind of just uh, rules of thumb. And so that's what I had read. And then the other thing is I, you know, I, I realized that a lot of the times by the time I get a question on goosegrass, it's usually mid-July. Um, and so, you know, it, it makes sense that if you see goosegrass in mid-July, that um, we could assume that it germinates maybe in late June, mid June, or early July. Um, so, and, and obviously, when this weed emerges, is really going to affect, you know, when we should apply our pre-emergence products. Um, so it seemed like to me there wasn't a lot of great information on when does it emerge. So we tried to get at least get some initial information on how to answer that um, in 2017 and 2018. I wish I had a picture of it, but um, you know, my group here, we we basically set up uh, sites on two golf courses and at the research facility, where uh, at least every week, sometimes multiple times per week, we went out to the same fixed area, and we and crawled around, you know, in the turf grass, you know, hands and knees kind of thing with tweezers finding, looking for goosegrass seedlings, you know, what the, the cotyledon seed that you actually see, uh, I don't know why it's not coming up here, you know, this image that you see here. So we were crawling around looking for these, you know, in the soil, because if you, you know, even if you've got a plant this big, oxidizon is not likely to control it at this stage. 
you've got a crabgrass plant at this stage, the thiopyr will control it. So that's that's a challenge with goosegrass. So again, we were, you know, spent a lot of those two years doing this work to try to figure out when does it germinate, probably counted 20,000 plants. So basically if we see a plant, we pull it out of the ground and then come back the next week and see what else has come up. So you start to get an idea of when does it germinate. And then we've been working with uh, uh, a, an environmental data science group, uh, Measure IO, to kind of put some temperature data and model data behind this. Um, but basically what we found is by the first or second week of May, that's when goosegrass starts to emerge on golf courses in the fairway um, and even on the research facility. So um, that's really when these things need to be applied, these pre-emergence. And um, that's actually, I think, a lot of times when we're applying that to thiopyr for crabgrass control. So that could be one of the challenges is, you know, got to get this oxidizon out by the first or second week of May. Um, essentially, you know, we're working to put some, some numbers behind that model. But once we get a few days of high temperatures around 80 degrees, that seems to be what sets it off. Um, and so, you know, by the time we get to the end of May, we've really got a lot of those seedlings that have emerged. You can see this graph here, essentially where you get, you start to see these blue bars, that's when, uh, that's when our model shows that these plants start to emerge out of the ground. And so um, really by week 20 here, which is the second week of May in 2018, uh, that's when we need, we need to have these out. We've looked at this every year since, validating the model, and every year it's the second or third week of May is, is when uh, when we get emergence. So critical that you get it out and also watered in by by that time. Does that help answer questions? Are there any other questions about timing? Now we've got another poll here. We can put, All right. how do I put, we put up the All poll. Right. Put up the so uh, we're gonna launch another poll right now. So uh, please answer it and we'll move on. These questions should be pretty easy. Ah, oh, you guys are getting the hang of it. Going quick. Another thing you can do if you're concerned about emergence is you can look at south-facing slopes, areas where where the soil is bare. Uh, and there's not turf cover. You typically get emergence sooner because the soil temperature actually fluctuates more. Throughout the day, the temperatures get warmer during the day and lower at night, and that actually helps trigger emergence. It's not just the high temperature during the day, but that fluctuation between day and night that, that triggers That's a lot of discrimination. So That's interesting. Yeah. All right, we'll give it another 10 seconds, 15 seconds. So, you know, if you're looking at a multi-application program, just early applications in May, um, and other applications six to eight weeks later. But then, of course, if we get a really severe summer weather, you know, you make a second application in mid to late June. Um, by the time we get to mid-August, that that herbicide has broken down considerably, even if you've got a second app. So you, right. you know, you'd, you'd like to you'd like that that pre-emergence to get you through August, yep. but there's a chance that it might not, and so. Close. You know, when we get, close it down. Okay. When we get those severe weather summers, you know, you just want to have multiple tools in the toolbox to try to control it. I think we, you know, Josh, you kind of mentioned this earlier with the T-box thing, but these pre-emergence really aren't tested or designed to control in really bare soil situations. Um, they're look, they're really designed to kind of supplement other strategies and the best defense we have is really a good stand of turf against against uh, these annual weeds especially. All right, for some reason my computer is locked up. Can't close the question. This is a first. For some reason, I don't know why. So, Josh, did you have a question about growing degree day models for? Yeah, yeah, I was just curious if there's a specific model that you guys tend to like that yeah. main users can use or go to. Um, 
for for crabgrass, I still, you know, there have been some growing degree day models developed over the years. My preference is still to use Porcythia full bloom as a good indicator. Um, and then for goosegrass, we're we're in the process of working to develop models, but um, we don't we don't have one yet because what we found is it's actually best to look at a rolling average of growing degree days rather than cumulative. You know, because you can have a week like this where it's 65 degrees, you're gonna get to 70 at the end of the week. Um, we're gonna accumulate growing degree days, but but we probably haven't triggered much development in the grass seeds to actually get germination and then we get cold again. So what a growing degree is that accumulate now, you know, what do those even mean for later? So we've actually found that, you know, it's kind of a, when you get an average accumulation uh, of about 20 growing degree days or, or 10 growing degree days a day, um, that that's uh, at a 50 degree window that can start to trigger things. But really I like, the rule of thumb I like best after looking at all this is you know get a few days in the mid 80s. Uh, that seems to, to set it off. Hey Matt, you're all set now. Okay, so that's that. what we, we've been putting on our trials. You know, we try to time it pretty close. We've been putting on our trials um, whenever we get a few days at 80 degrees. Is when I usually start to sweat about it a little bit. And get <laughs> well, let's let's get going on these trials. So. Um, you know, one day in the 80s, probably not. You know, you get a few days, that soil gets warmed up. Um, and, you know, a lot of it uses two-inch soil temperatures as well. That that gets gets tricky, but... Matt, you're all uh, set. All right. So are there any other questions about when this uh, emerges? Otherwise, it's 2 o'clock, so I better move on to some of the post-emergence discussion here. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, especially in bent grasses, that the timing is really important. Because if we look at what we, we'd really like to be applying those post immersion herbicides to plants that are sized like what you see on the top of the screen, or maybe a five leaf plant that you see on the lower left um, here. Once you get to a tillered state in a bent grass situation, you're, you're gonna be kind of fighting an uphill battle because the products that are available for controlling it um, can't be applied at rates that will control plants this large in bent grass because they don't have the safety. So, um, you know, in a bent grass fairway, if you look at the upper left-hand corner of the screen, these are the the rates that can be applied to in a bent grass fairway. And I know superintendents and the industry has gotten really innovative with how do we use these products at low rates in bent grass. And I don't think we need to go into the to big details on that today. Um, but I think. You know, if you, especially if you don't have a pre-emergence program in place, or if you're not sure how effective your pre-emergence program is, looking at a program where you start making Kylex applications or acclaim applications at low rates, even as early as Memorial Day, you know, frequently throughout the season, is what you have to do if you don't have an effective pre-emergence program. Um, and that would be in bent grass. If you get to rough areas, you know, you can use higher rates, you can use acclaim, and Pilex at higher rates and, and they'll control plants this large so you can afford to be a little bit more economical in those areas. We've looked at soil moisture. Soil moisture is really important. Um, if you have poor soil moisture then the products you know like Acclaim and Pilex do not work as well. Um, this is some work that we did over the last couple years. So that's really important. You want these plants to be actively growing. So is that more questions? along the lines of like Rainfall, you can time it, or you can water that night before your application? Yeah, it's tricky. If we don't know is the short answer. When we did this experiment, we had the plants under the different moisture regimens for two weeks before and two weeks after the application. So those plants that are drought stressed are drought stressed for two weeks before, day of application, and you know we didn't water them until two weeks later. So that's that's kind of like the next thing that needs to be done maybe is okay let's say you're under a period of drought stress if you water the day before is that enough is it not uh, I guess the short answer is we we don't we don't know um, what we found is that the, the reason that they were less effective is thought there was just less transpiration and less uh, movement you know, through the plant of the herbicide um, not not maybe so much that it didn't get absorbed into the plant. But it's a good question. 
you know, I'd say to be safe, you'd want you'd want that plant to be well watered at least a few days before, and then up to uh, up to a week after. That's one of the things we did find is probably beyond a week after, you could probably start to subject that plant to some drought stress, and the herbicide would still work. So I don't know if that helps answer the question. I don't think we need to do a lot with this. We've done work looking at speed zone and Pilex. Um, that's useful in non bentgrass areas to reduce the bleaching from the Pilex alone. I, I'm also, you know, I want to be careful. Pilex is an excellent tool for goosegrass control, but, uh, we, you know, we're seeing right now what happens when we use dimension for many years for goosegrass control. We start to, that, that weed sees the same thing every year. And eventually you get an individual that figures out a way to survive it. And then that individual proliferates. So, you know, we're looking at, we're probably what year five or 10, five to seven to eight of Pilex use. Um, so if we don't start to complement that with a good pre-emergence program and maybe other post-emergence herbicides, um, then, you know, we could be looking at resistance to Pilex soon if we're not careful. Any questions on that? Again, this is non-bent grass. The other thing to keep in mind is that with post-emergence herbicides, you know, we get really good control initially, usually, and then that control drops off. It's not because the plants survive, but it's because there's new there's seedlings in the soil that will continue to germinate throughout the summer. So, you, you know, you've got a situation like this where you kill off these goosegrass plants in a ryegrass stand, well, you kill off those plants and now you've just exposed bare soil again. So there's no pre-emergence. There's gonna be more goosegrass seeds in the soil that say, hey, looks like it's time to germinate and grow. So um, you know, that can happen all the way through the month of August. All right, Matt, I, we got a question. Uh, someone mixes drive with Accelerate and Pilex. Uh, to, it seems to be a good post-emergent program. He wants to know if it can be mixed with Primo and other fungicides. Yeah. For goosegrass control, for goosegrass. Yeah. For goosegrass. So, um, so drive and Pilex is a good combination, uh, especially in non bent grass. But remember, the quinclorac or the drive has no activity against goosegrass at all. So that that mixture is a good one, but it's going to improve your crabgrass control, not your goosegrass control. Um, and then mixtures with the Primo and fungicides. I always get, you know, we haven't done the work. I think that's a better question answered by. By industry representatives and things. I think um, Primo is, is likely pretty safe. Um, and I know there's been a lot of use of Pilex in the claim with fungicides, you know, going out every three weeks on fairways. There's been some interesting work out of Virginia Tech that came out over the winter that um, they're, start, they're, they're seeing with some fungicides, um, tank mixing herbicides actually reduces their effectiveness. Um, but it doesn't necessarily present a phytotoxicity issue. I think those questions are best answered by the, the industry rep for, you know, the various products. Um, we just don't do a, a lot of that tang mixture research. A lot of it's been done with Primo, but maybe not necessarily with all the fungicides. So Matt, that has there been any? I'm sorry. Has there ahead. been any work done with hard water and herbicide and needing to? apply an herbicide activator to kind of bind to before you add your herbicides into the tank to be more yeah. successful? Yeah, there has. There's some herbicides that are really, really don't work well if the water is hard, um, glyphosate being one. Um, it depends on the product. Um, in general, if you have hard water, you, you'd want to be doing something to, to fix that problem, you know, an activator or a buffer or something like that. I think as a general rule, it's a good idea to avoid spraying with, with hard water um, because work's been done with, with certain compounds, um, but maybe, you know, not all of them. So as a, as a general rule, I'd avoid it, but glyphosate is a really characteristic herbicide that doesn't work well in that situation. I don't know about, you know, Pilex or a lot of the goosegrass claim type products. A lot of those claim is, is probably okay. Um, I don't have an exact, you know, it depends on the product, I guess, is the short answer. And um, I always check the label for that sort of thing because that's something that we might not have done, but it's probably been done internally during the development of that product. Okay. So. Awesome. 
Any other questions? I don't see any on the back chatboard. We got. Do we have another poll question we've got to do, or uh, should we do that because it's two o'clock, and then we can kind of. Um, or yeah, that's fine. Jay, you want to launch that? We can answer any questions after that. If there's any questions, I, I hope I, I think I've seen them all in the chat. But the last thing I was just going to talk about was the importance of you know turf cover and, and that kind of thing because um, that really just reduces the number of seedlings that germinate and makes it tougher for them to develop. Yep. Hey guys, 20 more seconds. I'm going to close the poll there. talk for hours on this topic <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> all right we're going to close her down so yeah and i'm happy to take questions on programs or you know that sort of thing um all right back to you back sure and i guess before i'm, I'm going to copy this um survey link in the chat here because if you all don't mind the polls are for your pesticide credits um, let me see if I can get this in the poll here. If I don't figure it out, then maybe we're just not going to have it. But I'm going to put this in the chat. And if you don't mind going to this, this is for Rutgers um, to evaluate what you thought of this class. Um, essentially, that's a link that's going to take you to a survey. Um, you'll see a screen that says Spring 2021 Instructional Rating Survey this webinar you click next it should bring up some questions a lot of questions the only questions that you really need to answer are the first and second questions um, you're welcome to answer the others but the most important for me are the first two questions of what you thought of this webinar um, so with that I uh, I'll show the short link there um, I'll go back to you know we can talk maybe close about some programs if people have questions but this is sort of how i like to hopefully you can see the slides still um, yep still good so you know there's no one size fits all strategy i think there's a lot to be gained from talking with your your peers your industry folks your your own experience but um you know one strategy if you've got a severe um severe infestation in certain areas and you don't I don't think you need to apply oxidized onto the entire golf course if goosegrass isn't problematic across the entire golf course. You know, so if you've got areas with a history that are really problematic, you know, going out in mid-May or early May with an application of oxidized on at two to three pounds per acre, that's active ingredient. That's going to really depend on the product you're using. Um, and that should, you know, should carry a lot of the weight combined with the healthy stand of turf. But you want to plan for post-emergence applications late in the summer. Um, try to be scouting those areas. If you've got a pre-emergence in place, try to be scouting those areas probably you know, in July and into August. Look for those small goosegrass plants. And if you see them you know, in bent grass, you want to be making an application of, of Pylex or a claim relatively soon at those low rates. Um, and then in the fall, you know, anything you can do to try to encourage the density of that stand. And one of the things that I've noticed in doing, visiting a lot of golf courses with goosegrass problems is um, it seems like it's a lot worse where there's perennial ryegrass, more so than bank grass. Um, bank grass tends to get denser, it tends to kind of produce a little bit of a mat layer that seems to keep keep the goosegrass out. But that turf competition, you know, is is almost on its own, you know, apples to apples, more effective than any herbicide. But you know, usually what we need is the herbicide and the the, the dense turf to work together. Um, so that's sort of a strategy one. A strategy two, maybe with a more minor infestation, you're not sure about oxidizon. You still think that the, the dithiopyr is probably working. 
um, you know, you'd want to make, you could potentially rely only on post-emergence applications um, and plan, you know, for multiple uh, applications throughout the season, starting as soon as you see those plants in the canopy, uh, those most severe areas, and start, start scouting, you know, as soon as Memorial Day. Um, but probably it'll realistically until early June. So um, I think the key with any of these is rotating herbicides uh, is really important. We, we don't have a lot of tools for, uh, for goosegrass control. Um, so we've really got to preserve the ones we have. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not seeing a lot coming down the, the herbicide development pipeline that's going to save our, save our you know, somehow uh, be a silver bullet for this problem. So, and really there's, there's no such thing as a silver bullet herbicide for, for any weed control problem. So that's really all I have. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time and all support of the New Jersey turf grass industry as we you know, keep uh, doing our research here. Support we get from New Jersey is, you know, is I think uh, really outstanding. Um, if, you know, so I I appreciate that and, and um, always looking for feedback on, you know, are we working on the things that, that you want us to be working on and um, that kind of thing. So if you've got other questions. Uh, there's a fact sheet I have a picture of it on the screen, but I don't want to keep everybody all afternoon. So Josh and uh, Jason, if you've got other questions, let me know. But if that's it, then I and thanks everybody for your time. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay, right, take over control again. Yeah, how do I get it back here? Oh, I already so took it, I think. Just, okay. Just uh, to reiterate, to get points, sending the uh, driver's license picture, put your uh, the speaker name, date of the webinar, and your date of birth, your Profac license number, and send that over to uh, the executive director at Turfgrass, New Jersey Turfgrass.org. Uh, we couldn't do it without your sponsors. Uh, the sponsors are amazing. We have a couple upcoming dates. Currently, field day is scheduled for the 27th of July with Adelphia on the 28th. That's subject to change due to any COVID restrictions with, uh, with Rutgers. Um, Fiddler's Elbow is August 16th. Uh, that would be the uh, Rutgers Golf Classic, a New Jersey Turfgrass Foundation Classic, I'm sorry. And then we are extremely excited to let everybody know that we are planning for a green light December 7th uh, to the 9th, back in the Borgata Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City for our New Jersey Turfgrass Expo. Um, thank you for everybody for attending. And if uh, there is anything we can do for you as an association, please don't hesitate to reach out. That's all, uh, that's all I have. Guys, thanks for, for joining us. Um, once again, we wanna thank our, our sponsors, everybody. Who uh, helps us uh, these, uh, put this, these uh, webinar series on? That it certainly helps us out and helps out uh, Rutgers University. Uh, just want to wish everybody have a great spring. Uh, weather's, weather's finally getting warm, and we're going to get out there and start working on our golf courses. And uh, like Josh said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask one of us or track us down. We'll certainly try to help you guys out as an association. So thanks guys. Have a good